the uh, uh, the uh, the convicts beat the uh, Niners um, on uh, Sunday. How many any Ravens fans here? Okay. Uh, I just want to identify the losers here. Uh, no, but but I don't know if you saw like right before or right after the second quarter ended. So kind of before the uh, halftime show, there was a a commercial that came on that uh, talked a little bit about knowledge and truth. I don't know if you saw that, but I, I've actually got it for you. I want to play it for you. And, uh, and really, that's going to set the, uh, the agenda for the rest of the night. So, so pay attention carefully to the message of this Super Bowl commercial. To the curious, the inquisitive, the seekers of knowledge, to the ones who just want to know about life, about the universe, about yourself. Not cute questions, big questions, ones that matter. To the rebels, the artists, the free thinkers, and the innovators who care less about labels and more about truth, who believe nonconformity is more than a bumper sticker, that knowledge is more than words on a page. You're young, you're old, you're powerful beyond measure, and the fuel of that power is not magic or mysticism, but knowledge. The things you see, the things you feel, the things you know to be true. Sure, some will doubt you. Let them. Dare to think for yourself, to look for yourself, to make up your own mind. Because in the eternal debate for answers, the one thing that's true is what's true for you. Okay, whatever you do, don't go to that website, please. Uh, <laughs> notice that last phrase right here. They're setting us up. The search for knowledge, the search for answers, the search for truth. And uh, those eternal big questions that every single human being asks. And at the end, the conclusion is the one thing that's true is what's true for you. And right there, a commercial probably viewed by like, what, 75 million, 100 million people here in the United States, throws out this idea. This idea, the idea is called relativism. It's the idea that something may be true for me, even though it may not be true for you. And you've just got to find your own truth. And here's what we know about you, uh, the American high school and junior high student. We know that most of you uh, have just simply absorbed this message from the society that you live in. And so this book right here, Soul Searching, is a major study on you, on teenagers, looking at the religious and spiritual lives of American teenagers. This is how the researchers, after a four-year major study on you, this is their conclusion. This is what they said about you. They said American youth, like American adults, so it's not just you, are nearly without exception profoundly individualistic. The typical bywords are, who am I to judge? If that's what they choose, whatever. Each person decides for himself, and if it works for them, fine. Some teenagers champion this skeptic's view of individual relativistic truth with great relish. Some version of this individualistic subjectivism and relativism, listen, is the dominant assumed viewpoint about religion amongst most contemporary U.S. adolescents. So after all this study on you, what they found is that this idea that your truth is what's true for you and other people have their own truth and you decide what's true for you, this relativism dominates the minds of American teenagers. And it's not just like out there in the world, it's in here in the church. One of the questions that the researchers asked, they asked students from different uh, kind of Christian backgrounds, what, you know, what do you think about the idea that there's one true religion? Okay, here's what when they talk to conservative Protestant students, that would be like students like you, you know, like your evangelical, free Baptist, uh, non-denominational, church like Crossline. You guys would be considered conservative Protestant. How many students in the typical conservative Protestant youth group do you think would affirm the idea that there's one true religion? Thirty-five percent. Okay. Yeah, yeah that, that's actually not far off. It was only 46%. So what that means is, is, is if you are the typical conservative Protestant youth group, that's less than half of you who would affirm 
that there is one true religion, that Christianity is, is true. If you go down the street to the, the mainline Protestant denominations, so like Presbyterian, Lutheran, Methodist, Episcopal, those kind of churches, that number drops to 26%. So you can see, even in here, in the typical church, this is the minority view. Now, look, oftentimes I think we in the church have like this skewed view of Jesus. Like we think Jesus was just like this super nice guy. And uh, he was just so nice. And they, if you, you know, everyone just liked him. And if you just really knew the real Jesus, you'd just really love him. And, and he'd be like your buddy. And he'd be like your friend. And certainly there's the aspect that, you know, that Jesus does love us. But John tells us in John 1 that Jesus comes with grace, but he also comes with something else. Anyone know what that was? He comes in grace and in truth. In truth. And so Jesus says some things that tip people off. See, I don't, I don't think that if a lot of people heard Jesus today, they'd be like, oh, I love you, Jesus. You're such a cool guy. He would really take people off. He said things like this in John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And Jesus' closest followers said the very same thing. Peter, in Acts 4, 12, says, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. This is the clear message of the Old and New Testament. That Jesus is the only way. He's, he's the truth. In fact, we, we put together a little resource because what we found at Stand to Reason is that lots of Christians don't even have confidence that, that, that Jesus is the only way. That he's exclusively true. And so we put together this little resource that outlines a hundred verses Nine different lines of argument from the Bible just to help Christians realize this is what the scriptures teach. That Jesus is the only way. Notice it's thin for the reading challenge here. Okay? But, um, but, but we wanted to make a clear argument like, hey, this is what Jesus said. Okay. Now, this is what Peter writes about Jesus in 1 Peter 2.8. He didn't say, hey, just, just present Jesus and everyone's going to love you. What does Peter say about Jesus? He says that Jesus is a stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. You see, when we as Christians start to make these truth claims, and when people start hearing about Jesus saying, hey, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other path to God except through me. The response from our culture and our society is this. Right? I'm offended. That's ridiculous, you Christians. You claim to know the truth? Give me a break. You claim that your religion is the one true religion? Give me a break. I'm offended. Now, now think, think about this response for a second. Because we hear this all the time. I'm offended. I'm offended. I'm offended. Uh, do you ever get offended? I do. Yeah, I get offended. Uh, you know who offends me the most in my life? My wife. My wife offends me the most. But but here's when she offends me. Okay? So we're like driving on a you know California freeway. We're like on the 405. Somebody just cut me off. And I get this elbow, right, in my ribs. And my wife will lean over and say something like, uh, honey, uh, you probably shouldn't shout lethal threats and other drivers. Okay? <laughs> or like at home, my wife will come up to me and she goes, you know, uh, Brad, I saw how uh, you were kind of interacting you know, with our son Micah, and you were kind of a jerk. You were really impatient. You might need to say sorry to him. You really hurt his feelings. What's my response? My first response is, I'm offended. Are you kidding? What? Do you know what Micah did? Did you see what that driver did? He cut me off. And I get offended. But you know what? That is a sign of my immaturity. I think this response, I'm offended, is really a sign of our immaturity. And this is a sign of our culture's immaturity. Because look, when my wife confronts me with something, and my response is simply offense, well, am I listening to what she says? Am I taking into account what she says? No, I'm just getting my feelings hurt, I'm ticked off. But I have to, look, my goal 
when it comes to my kids is to be a, a good dad. I want to be a mature dad. I want to be a mature human being. I don't want to be a jerk on the freeways. I want to, I want to be a mature follower of Jesus Christ. And so what I have to do is I have to set my offense aside, right? Like when my wife confronts me on something, I have, to, I have to set my offense aside. I've got to put it away, and I have to ask a very important question. Is what she said actually true? Is it true that I was a jerk to my son and I, I, that I need to apologize to him? Is that true? You see, and if I want to grow, if I want to be mature, I have to seek after the truth no matter where it leads me. It might lead me to say, you know what? I'm wrong. I'm wrong here. And this is what we want to move uh, people to, is asking this more mature question. What is true? So when it comes to our religious beliefs, what's true? Because Jesus claims that he's the way, the truth, and the life. The culture is going to get ticked off. In fact, not only will they get offended, but they're going to start throwing objections at you, right? They're going to throw objections. So here's what I want to do. I want to take four of these objections you're going to hear from the culture when we talk about Jesus being true. And let's kind of take them and deal with them and think through them and maybe set them aside. And then... Uh, I'll, we'll talk about how we can know what is true. All right? So here are four objections. When you claim to have the truth, that the culture is going to bring up against you. All right? So here's number one. You say Jesus is the only way. You say Christianity is true. People are going to look at you and go, give me a break. You have 1.5 billion Muslims around the world. You have hundreds of millions of Hindus. You've got hundreds of millions of Buddhists. You've got millions of people who believe Different things than you Christians. So how can you, Christians, say that you have the monopoly on religious truth? I mean, that's ridiculous, isn't it? you got all these other world views, all these other world religions, and you think you've got the one true religion? Give me a break. Now, how would you answer that objection? I'm just curious. Any thoughts? How would you deal with that? It's kind of a challenge objection. Okay, here's what I want to do. I want to step back and I want you to think through this. Because I, I don't want to come here tonight and just give you a bunch of answers. My goal is not just to tell you what to think. I want to teach you how to think. All right? So let's think through this here. What is the, what, what's the process of reasoning that's going on here? What is this person really saying here? Well, let me give you a, uh, a, a, an analogy to help you see how this is really an example of some really bad thinking. Sloppy thinking. Poor thinking. All right? So let me take you back to uh, kindergarten math, all right? You're in kindergarten math, and your teacher, uh, Ms. Crabapple, is, uh, is teaching math, right? And so she writes up on the, your, 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 uh, your classroom board, she writes 2 plus 2 equals a line. And she turns to the class. She says, okay, class, what do you think the answer is? So uh, what's your name? Sutton. Sutton. All right, so a little Sutton in the first row. He raises his hand. Oh, Miss Crabapple, Miss Crabapple, I know what the answer is. What is it, son? Oh, the answer is four. And so she writes that up on the board. But then, name. Elizabeth, little Elizabeth. She says, no, 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 something's wrong. The answer's five. So Miss Crabapple writes that up on the board. And then she goes, all these little, you know, kindergartners start raising their hands and giving all these different possible answers, right? The two plus two equals one. Now, 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 what does a good math teacher, what does a good math teacher like Miss Crabapple do when she's written all these possible answers to this math equation? Well, if she's really smart, she would look at the class and say, class, look at all these possible answers to 2 plus 2. We just can't say that there's one right answer because there's so many possible answers. Is, is that what a good math teacher would do? No. Of course not. We'd fire that math teacher, right? We'd fire this crab apple because what we would want her to do is to say, look, okay, these are all possible answers, but just because you have a lot of possible answers, does that mean you can't have one right answer? No. You see, that doesn't follow, does it? Just because you've got a lot of possible religions out there. I mean, does anyone disagree with the fact that there are many religions out there? Of course not. Yeah, lots of people believe different things. But can you move from this fact that there are many religions to the conclusion that therefore there's not one true religion? No, that's a, it's actually a logical fallacy. If you know anything about logic, this is a logical fallacy called a non sequitur. 
Non sequitur, you can write that down, non sequitur. Non sequitur simply means it does, that the conclusion does not follow. It doesn't follow, just like in that example that I gave you of the math equation. Just because you have lots of possible answers to 2 plus 2, it doesn't follow that you can't have one right answer. You see? And in the same way, just because you have lots of possible religions, it doesn't follow that you can't have one true religion. Now, which religion is the true religion is a separate question. At this point, we're just saying, look, just because there's lots of possibilities doesn't mean we can't have a true answer. And so we set that objection aside, but of course, you'll get another objection. Well, aren't all religions basically the same? I mean, what's it matter? You, you, you Christians get all hyper about this stuff, but at the end of the day, all religions are basically the same. How would we answer this? Well, no, no, okay, stick with me. There's a very highly technical philosophical answer to this, okay? Get ready. You might want to write this down. When people ask you, aren't all religions basically the same? Here is the highly technical philosophical answer. Okay? No. No. It's actually a simple answer. Now, are there any similarities with religions? Yeah. In fact, there's a, a little excerpt from uh, the Modern Thinker's Creed, kind of a poem, that really describes similarities and the differences. It says this, We believe that all religions are basically the same. They all believe in love and goodness. They only differ on matters of creation, sin, heaven, hell, God, and salvation. Alright? Here's, here's the deal. When it comes to, when it comes to love and goodness, moral things, what we find in world religions is this basic kind of commonality. Like, lots of religions will say, hey, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? The golden rule kind of thing. You find morality in all religions. But when you look at the specifics about God, about the afterlife, about salvation or enlightenment or whatever it might be, you've got radically different views. And so let's just take one. In fact, we're going to go through this one a lot more next, next week. Mormonism, Christianity. Mormons claim that Mormons are Christians, right? When you look at their view of God, you have a view that God was once a man who actually became God. He worked his way to God's land. Now, when you compare that to Christianity, and we're just doing a comparison at this point, we're not even asking which one's true, we're just doing a comparison. Christianity says, Christianity says God was always God. He never was a man. He's always been God. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth, right? John 4, 24. And so what you have is two mutually exclusive ideas. Can God be a man and not a man at the same time? Of course not. That's a contradiction. Contradictory ideas both can't be true. These are mutually exclusive. Now, someone's going to look at you and go, there you go, Christian. You want to focus on the negatives, right? This is what Christians always do. You focus on the... Can't we just focus on the, 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 the commonalities? Can't we focus on things that we, you know, we have in common? Why do you always focus on the negative? <coughs> well, it's because the differences are critical. Let me give you an example. Let's say I'm holding two white pills in my hand. And I ask you, are these pills basically the same? Basically the same? Yeah. Yes. Well, at this point, you've got to say yes, right? They're both white. They're both round. They both come in tablet form. Okay, so basically the same, right? Well, what if I told you that one set of pills is aspirin and the other set of pills is arsenic? Does that change anything? Yeah. In fact, what happens to the similarities? The similarities become irrelevant. It doesn't really matter that they're both white and both round. What you want to know is the differences, because if you don't know the differences in this situation, you're going to die. Okay? You're going to be dead if you take the wrong pill. The differences are critical. And in the same way, this is what we're saying. When we look at world religions, world religions offer a whole different view of God, about salvation, about how you get right with God or the divine or whatever. And there are different, you know, Christianity says, hey, here are the consequences. Hinduism says, here's the consequences in the afterlife. Uh, Islam says, here are the consequences in the afterlife. Very different consequences. The differences are critical. Look, if the Mormon is right and I'm wrong, I'm okay because of their view of the afterlife. If I'm right and the Mormon's wrong, not so much. And so we set this objection aside, but then they bring up a third objection. What about people in other religions who are so sincere? Right? I mean, come on. I know 
Boot, my, my Buddhist neighbor is, I bet, probably more sincere than every single Christian in this room. They're more devoted, more sincere. They're not like you Christians who are hypocrites. They're really sincere about what they believe. How do you answer that objection? Because, gosh, I mean, I, I do know people from other religions who are very sincere about what they believe. Really, like, devoted. Well, let's think through this. Here would be my question. Is it possible to be sincerely wrong? Is that possible? Yeah. And there are certain times when it's probably like, gosh, it's going to really be bad. It's going to be a bad news for you if you like are sincerely wrong about certain things. Like if you were, if you came into this room sincerely believing like that tonight, you know, uh, Faith Talk started here at 7 o'clock, and you came into this room and you found out that you were sincerely wrong and that it was in a different room, that's not going to like change your life, right? But uh, how many, anybody here gone skydiving before? One skydiver. Indoor, sky yeah. Indoor skydiving. That does not count. That's the wins. Okay. They're, they're right there. That's, that's a very brave person. Okay. How, how many of you want to go skydiving with sincere beliefs? Right? Yeah. No. You're, it's, uh, you're, you're 10,000 feet above the Earth's surface. You got your gear on. You sincerely believe that, that that parachute that's on your back is a working parachute. You believe it with all your heart. You're trusting the instructor who put it on there. right? You sincerely believe that you've got a working parachute. So what do you do? You jump out of the plane. That, that's crazy that you would jump out of a plane. I mean, you're a little crazy, but that's okay. Um, I think it's crazy. You jump out of the plane. Now, imagine, just imagine, you, you know, you're plummeting to the earth. And what do you do? Eventually, you're going to pull that ripcord, right? What if you pull that ripcord and find out that you were sincerely wrong? Well, when you land, that's going to change the way you look. I mean, that's going to kill you. Sincere beliefs in that situation are, are, are going to jack you up. And so it's not enough. So here's the point. It's not enough to go skydiving and just be sincere. It's not enough for your beliefs to be sincere. It doesn't matter how sincere you are. The more important question is, what is true? True. That's right. What is true? Now, of course, we've got to be sincere. Sincerity is, is, is uh, necessary, but it's not enough. And so we set that objection aside. We have one more objection. People are going to look at you, and they're going to say, you are a narrow-minded, bigoted, fundamentalist. Right? You think your religion's the only, only way? You are so narrow-minded. You narrow-minded Christians. How do we respond to this? When someone calls you narrow-minded, what do you say? Well, I think there's three things we could say. Okay? Here's the first one. I think sometimes we can kind of call people out on this in, in, in a nice way. All right? Because here's what we know. This is actually, when someone says you're narrow-minded, they're attacking you. Not your view. Right? If I say Jesus is the only way to God, and someone says, Brett, you're narrow-minded. Notice, what are they doing? They're attacking me. Not my claim. They're not saying anything about whether or not Jesus is the only way. They're saying something about me. That is what we call, in logic, an ad hominem. Against the man. Right? When you call someone a name... I mean, that's not a good way to argue for something. I mean, if they say, oh, you're narrow-minded, and I look at them and go, oh, yeah, well, your mom is so ugly. That, <laughs> well, well that, would, that would be no different. Saying that we're narrow-minded is simply a sophisticated way to call you a name and oftentimes to shut you off. And here's what you can do. I remember uh, a number of years ago, uh, I was working in a fine dining restaurant as a waiter. And uh, it was a French restaurant here in Southern California. And there was a, another waiter there, actually a French guy. His name was Maurice. And uh, Maurice was, uh, was a pretty cool guy. We, we totally got along. We loved to have good conversation after uh, work because we were totally on different ends of the political spectrum. We always talk about politics. And so one night we got this conversation about abortion. And I started laying out my views about abortion. And I was, I was laying out my views and actually giving uh, a scientific case for why I believe what I believe. Midway through the conversation, I remember Maurice looks at me. 
He looks at me and he, uh, he just kind of shakes his head. And with his like thick French accent, he looks at me and says, Regrets for being so young. You are so narrow-minded. And so what did I do? I, I didn't take offense. It didn't hurt my feelings. But I wanted to stop the conversation. And I wanted to point this out to him. So I said, hey, Maurice, notice what happened here. We're talking about this issue, really important issue. I give you my views. I lay out my reasons why. I give you an argument for why I think the way I do. And what do you do? What's your response? I said, Maurice, you simply called me a name. You called me narrow-minded. But notice, you didn't say anything about my argument. You didn't say anything about the scientific evidence I presented. You just said I was narrow-minded. That's no different than calling me a name. And I tried to be cool about it. I wasn't ticked off. And I, was trying to be, I tried to be gracious. And Maurice's response was, was just classic. He looked, I remember he kind of looked up at the ceiling like he was thinking about that. Probably never been confronted on this before. And he go, he, 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 he's thinking about it and he looks at me and he goes, Fred, you're right. And then he said, I'm sorry. And then he must have apologized like 20 times after that. He's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for calling you a name. I said, it's no problem. But what I want to do is get back to the, the issue. And this is simply a way for you to, you know, to shut someone up, but let's deal with the arguments and the evidence. And so I think you can call people on that. Now, some of you might, might be like, well, that's kind of confrontational. I don't know about that. So here's the second thing you can do. When someone says you're narrow-minded, you ask them, what do you mean by that? <laughs> what do you mean by that? Get a little more information. Get some clarification. What do you mean I'm narrow-minded? What does that mean? If someone says, well, you don't listen to anything I say. You're not even open to what I have to say. Well, that's not good. We don't want to be that, if that's what narrow-minded means. But that's not what most people mean. When they say that you're narrow-minded, here's what they typically mean. They say, they, they, if, so if someone says, Brett, you're narrow-minded. I say, what do you mean by that? They're going to say something like this typically. You think you're right, and everyone else is wrong. That's narrow-minded. Right? You claim your religion is right, and every other religion is wrong. You think you're right, and everyone else is wrong. That's narrow-minded. Now, do you see any problems with that claim? If, if it's, okay, so they're saying you're narrow-minded. What's narrow-minded mean? You think you're right and other people are wrong. That's narrow-minded. Well, my question to them is, well, are you saying that I'm wrong about that? Yeah, yeah. yeah of course. Well, so you think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, well, okay, on your same definition then, guess what? You're narrow-minded too. We're both narrow-minded people. Let's, have, let's continue the conversation. Right, you see, their view of narrow-mindedness is self-contradictory. If, if, what are they doing? They're correcting you. Well, to correct someone means that you think they're wrong and you think you're right. And so, if that's narrow-minded, we're both narrow-minded. But see, here's the problem. Whenever you make a claim... And you claim that, you're, that it's true, well, that's narrow. That's just narrow by definition. And this is the third idea here. Truth is narrow by definition. Right? When I go into uh, my doctors, and I'm like, doctor, I'm not feeling good. Uh, and doctor says, okay, let's run some tests. Let's, let's do an MRI. Let's, uh, you know, let's do some x-rays. And, and they do an assessment, right, of, of, of my physical health. And the doctor comes back and says, okay, Brett, we've discovered you've got this disease. You've got this disease, but thank goodness we have the cure. What you've got to do over the next month is you've got to take this medicine. This is the cure. This will heal you of your disease. Take this medicine. What is my response to the doctor? Well, wait, are you telling me there's only one thing I can take? This, I don't know. I, maybe I'll go home and try, you know, just eating a lot of ice cream. Maybe that'll make them better. And the doctor says, no, take this medicine or you're going to die. This is it. This is the cure. This is the cure. Am I going to look at my doctor and go, you know what, doctor? That's just really narrow-minded. That's, you know, you're just intolerant right now. Me as a patient. Of course not. I'm not going to do that because I know that truth is by definition narrow. If 2 plus 2 equals 4, guess what? That's narrow, isn't it? It eliminates all kinds of options. And so as we talk about... Jesus being the truth, these are the objections we're going to have to set aside. Now, here's another question that you're going to get, right? How do you know? Because I, my claim tonight is that Jesus is the only way. I agree with Jesus. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I agree with him. I think he's right about that. But how do we know that? 
How in the world could you and I know whether or not Jesus is the only way, if he's the truth? Well, here's what we're going to do now. We've set aside those objections. Now what I want to talk to you about is, is how we know what we know. Okay, but, but before I do this, you're going to have to be able to stick with me, okay? Uh, I'm going to give you some, like, deep philosophy right now. Okay, are you ready? Yes. Think you can handle it? Okay, so here's some philosophy that I think at the end of this, if you stick with me, I think it's going to really help you to lay a foundation for the rest of our series. And really for the rest of your Christian life. So, how do we know what we know? Well, the very first thing that we have to do is we have to define knowledge. What is knowledge? I don't know if you know this, but there are three different kinds of knowledge. Let me lay them out for you. Okay, now, pause for a sec. I realize that um, this worksheet is probably not a lot of help. Um, you might want to just turn it to the back. As I kind of change this up for you guys a little bit. Um, go to the back and you can take some notes there. But this is not on your handout. Okay, so three kinds of knowledge. Three kinds of knowledge. Number one, we have what's called propositional knowledge. There is propositional knowledge. That's simply, here's another way to think of it. It's knowing that. Propositional knowledge is knowing that. So, let me give you an example. Uh, anybody here been to Paris, France? Anybody? Really? Okay. Few, okay, number of people. The rest of us have not been there. But can you have knowledge about Paris, France, even if you don't go there? Yes. Absolutely. So you can read a book, right? You can get online, and you can gain propositional knowledge about Paris, France. And so you might know that the Eiffel Tower is located in Paris, France, right? That's called propositional knowledge. You haven't been there, but you know by reading the, the right sources, a history book, a geography book, or whatever, a travel book, that you know that the Eiffel Tower is in Paris, France. That's propositional knowledge. In fact, most of our knowledge is this. It's knowledge that we know all kinds of we, have, we know all kinds of uh, things propositionally. But that's not the only kind of knowledge. There's a second kind of knowledge. It's what we call knowledge by acquaintance. Knowledge by acquaintance. Knowing who or knowing of. So, let's go back to our Paris, France analogy here. You might have propositional. You might have knowledge that the Eiffel Tower is in Paris. But you've never been there. So that's about all you can tell us. But let's say one of you, you've been to France. You've been to Paris, France, and, and not only have you been to Paris, France, but you have gone and visited the Eiffel Tower. You've stood in front of it. And now you have a different kind of knowledge. You, just don't, you don't just know some facts about the Eiffel Tower. You now know of the Eiffel Tower. You now have acquaintance. You have a direct acquaintance with the Eiffel Tower. You see it. Maybe you touch it. You maybe you know, uh, take a ride up. Uh, and, and, and you now have a different kind of knowledge, don't you? Wouldn't you say that's different than simply knowing facts? If you've actually been there and experienced it, you have this like kind of direct knowledge. Like you're like, I can, I can smell the smells. I can, I can, t I can touch the metal. I can feel it. I, you know, I just, I, I, I know of it. And sometimes this is like with people. I mean, I might have knowledge of my wife. I might know that she's, you know, five six. That she's the mother, of, you know, a five. That she's, you know, this and that. But, but is, that, is, is that my relationship with my wife, just knowing a bunch of facts about her? No, I, I have this deep acquaintance with her. So I, like, I can just know when she walks in the room whether she's happy or, or ticked off without her saying anything. Just by looking at her because I have this, this knowledge by acquaintance. So that's a different kind of knowledge. But that's not the only kind of knowledge. Uh, those two, there's this, what we call skill knowledge. Knowledge. Uh, uh, knowledge of how. So, for instance, I might have propositional knowledge about the Eiffel Tower. I might say, okay, I want to go visit the Eiffel Tower. I fly over to France. I go, I visit the Eiffel Tower. I have not only propositional knowledge, now I get knowledge of the Eiffel Tower. I visit it, I check it out. But, say I'm going around France, i got to figure out how to get to the, from the airport to the Eiffel Tower. And so that's going to take some skill, some know-how. And so if I go there and I make some left turns, some wrong turns, and it takes me two hours to get from the, air, you know, the uh, airport in Paris to the Eiffel <laughs> Tower, I might make some mistakes along the way, but eventually I will learn how to get there. I'll get knowledge about how. So next time I go there, I might know how to make from the airport to the Eiffel Tower. You see how you can also have skill knowledge. 
Some of us are really good at fixing things. We have know-how. Like your refrigerator breaks down at home or TV breaks down and like your parents are like, hey, come here and help me. Uh, how, do, how, do I, how do I fix this? Especially with technology. You know, your mom and dad are like, okay, the computer's not working. Okay, what's wrong? You've got some know-how and you're like, well, you see the power button? Push that. It'll, it'll turn on. Um, and so there, that's another kind of knowledge. So do you understand the three different kinds of knowledge? Yeah. Okay, first kind is what? Propositional knowledge or knowing that. Second kind of knowledge is knowledge by acquaintance or knowing knowing who or of. Good. And then thirdly, you got skill knowledge, knowing how. Now listen, does knowledge play a role in our relationship with Jesus Christ? Yes. Absolutely. In fact, listen to what Jesus says in John 17, 3. In John 17, 3, Jesus says this. He says, this is eternal life. How does Jesus define eternal life? This is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God of Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. You see, eternal life equals knowing God. But that knowledge isn't just knowing facts about God. No, all three kinds of knowledge are involved in our relationship with God. There are facts that we need to know about God. But that we don't just know God and know a bunch of facts, but we also have a relationship with Him. We know who He is. We know of Him. But then there's also skills that are involved in being a Christian. There are disciplines. There are things like study the Bible, prayer, fasting, these kinds of things that, that help us become the kind of followers of Jesus that we're supposed to be. And so knowledge is a very vital part. Here it is. Knowledge is essential to your relationship with Jesus. It's not simply about faith. I don't know if you know this, but the New Testament talks more about knowledge than it does about faith. And the claim of the New Testament is that we can know God exists. We can know Jesus is the only way. Now, here's what we know about our knowledge, though. Much of our knowledge is propositional. And what, when philosophers talk about propositional knowledge, they define it this way. It's justified True belief. Okay? Like I said, we're getting deep into philosophy, but stick with me. We're going to make this all make sense. Not propositional knowledge. If you say that you know that, you are saying that you have justified true belief. Now think about those three things. I'm going to take them in reverse order. Let's start with belief. Have you ever thought, like, what's a belief? What does it mean to believe something? What is that? Well, a belief is simply what we might call uh, an affirming attitude. Okay, A belief, you could define belief as like a, uh, a, a good attitude towards a proposition. A mental, it's a mental attitude of accepting or affirming. That's what you mean when you believe something. You affirm it. right? I believe that. Okay, I have a positive mental affirmation of that thing. That's what a belief is. Now think about this. Can you locate your beliefs in physical space? <coughs> Are your beliefs physical? Can I crack open your head and look in your brain and find your beliefs physically? No. That right there is an argument that matter is not all that exists. There are non-physical things that exist. Beliefs are non-physical things. Okay, so you got a belief. A belief is simply a positive attitude towards some proposition. Okay? So that's a belief. Knowledge is justified true belief. Okay, so it's, now it's not. Is belief the same thing as knowledge? Well, of course not. Uh, because you can have beliefs, but you can have beliefs that are what? False. And if, we, if you had a false belief, well, we wouldn't want to say that you know it. You don't know it. It's false. And so there's a second thing that we want to say if you know something. Not only do you believe it, but it's true. Right? And so uh, you don't want to say you've got true beliefs, but let's define true. Okay? This is really important. Here it is. What does it mean? What do we mean when we say something's true? Truth is when your belief matches up with reality. Truth is when your belief corresponds to reality. This is what's called the correspondence theory of truth. Philosophers call it the correspondence theory of truth. I call it common sense. Your beliefs are true if they match up with reality. Does that make sense? Yeah, so we make all kinds of claims. I might say to you uh, something like this. Uh, I might say, I surf. 
That statement is made true by what? By reality, right? If I say I serve, that statement is true if it matches up with reality. If I say Jonah is my 17-month-old son, that statement is true if it matches up with reality, right? Duh. Pretty common sense. If it matches, if, if someone said, hey, a crux group start tonight, that would be a, a claim, an idea, maybe a belief that would be false because it doesn't match up with reality, you see? And so truth is that which corresponds to reality. Here's how the Greek philosopher Aristotle put it. He said it this way. Uh, when you say that it is, and it is, or you say that it isn't, and it isn't, that's true. If you say that it isn't, and it is, or you say that it is, and it isn't, that's false. Thank God for philosophers. Right? <laughs> I mean, all he's doing is saying, like, what's common sense? If you say that it is, and it isn't, that's false. If you say that it is, and it is, that's true. Truth is that which corresponds to reality. Right? Do you get that? I mean, that's... Okay, because I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not feeling the love here yet. Very simple. Okay, all right, all right. Now, here's the key. What? Truth is grounded in reality. Truth is grounded in reality. That's the point. You want to make sure your, your beliefs match up with reality. Now, I'm going to pause here. i got a question. Go for it. Okay, we'll keep going. Now, look. Now, here's the claim. When I say things like, Jesus is the only way, or Christianity is true, here's going to be the response from people in our culture. They're going to say, that's just your truth. That's your truth. That, that's your truth for you Christians. But the Hindu... He's got his own truth. Just like, right, go back to that Scientology commercial. You know, what's true for you is true for you. What's true for me is what's true for me. All right, so people are going to say that's your truth. But I want you to know what they've done. They've mistaken these two categories that we've talked about. They've mistaken truth and belief. Right, think about it. Here's, when people say, Brett, that's your truth. Jesus is your truth. Here's, here's what I ask them. What does my dad look like? Now, some of you have seen this analogy. Okay, so you've seen this analogy. Just, you know, hang with me. Some of you haven't seen this analogy. I think this will help you understand what we're after here. This will help you understand how truth is that which messes up with reality. So I said, what did my dad look like? Okay, somebody who does not know my dad, give me a guess. What do you think my dad looks like? Okay, so let, uh, okay, do you, do you know my dad? Brown hair. Okay, stand up, stand up. Okay, what's your name? Corey. Corey? Okay, Corey. What grade are you, Corey? Uh, seven. All right, Corey, seventh grade. Okay, Corey. So tell me, what kind of hair? What color hair do you think my dad has? Brown. Okay, brown. And uh, let's see, how tall do you think my dad is? Six foot. Six foot. I like you, Corey. You're a really intelligent guy. Okay, brown. Uh, six foot. And how much do you think my dad weighs? Dude, be careful. Be careful. <laughs> But you mean like a buff 225, right? That's I know. Okay, all right. So, um, so, so Corey says my dad is got brown hair. He's six foot and he's buff 225. Okay. Um, now, let's say Corey and I have this conversation. If I said to Corey, "Well, Corey, that must be your truth about my dad," is that is that an odd response? If I said, "Corey, that's your truth about my dad," and I have my own truth about my dad. Yeah, that, that's an odd response, isn't it? I wouldn't want to say he has his own truth about my dad. Can he have a different truth about my dad than I do? No. So, see, what happens when people say that's your truth, they've mistaken truth for opinion or belief. Right? And so, yeah, you can sit down, Corey. Um, now, now, we would say Corey has a belief that my dad is, has brown hair, six foot, is 225. We wouldn't say he has his own truth. Because you are entitled to your own beliefs, but you're not entitled to your own truth. So, if we wanted to say, okay, is his belief true or false, what would we do? Yeah, we check, we check. Wait, who said it? Someone said it. We would look at what? Reality, very good. We'd look at reality. So, if, if he gives me his description, what does my dad look like? And he's got his beliefs. Now we want to compare it to reality. Of course, my dad can't be here tonight, but I would put up a picture, and a picture represents reality, right? This is my dad. This is my dad, uh, Gary Kunkel. What? 
Why are you laughing at my dad? This is my dad. This is my dad. Yeah, he's Santa. My dad's Santa. It, it's true. All right. For those of you who... How many of you believe this is my dad? How many of you believe this is my dad? Okay, there's some smart people in here. But notice, it looks like the majority of you are not convinced. So, you don't think this statement is... Or you don't think this is true, that that's really my dad. So, what might I do? I haven't been able to prove it to you. So, what I might do is say, okay, well, let me show you some more pictures. Okay, so every year, notice Santa... Every year, my family, we go and we take a picture with that same Santa because he's my dad. And so we, every year, notice, there's my family. Notice the Santa. There he is. Look at that. It's the same Santa every single year. Because, of course, we want to take a picture with my dad, who's Santa. Now, is that enough proof? How many of you are now believers? How many think this is my dad? Raise your hand. Whoa, a bunch of skeptics. Bunch of doubters. So what are you, you're saying that you need more proof, right? You need more reasons to believe. Okay, um, let's see, what can I do here? Maybe I'll put up one more picture. That, that is me, obviously. That is my wife. That's my mom. And that is my dad. That is my biological father, Gary Cummings. Yes, I'm serious. <laughs> and those of you who are laughing at my dad are really hurting my feelings right now. No, that is my biological father. Now, I understand the skepticism, right? I mean, you look at me, you look at Santa, you're like, what's the deal here? Okay, we have a, a little mathematical equation to help you understand this. If you take Santa and you put him with a short Vietnamese woman, you get me. Okay, that's, that's how that works. And for those of you uh, junior hires who need more explanation, please talk to Eric. Okay, I don't know. That's about all I'm going to say. So notice here. Notice. Okay. The belief that my dad is has brown hair, is six foot, weighs 225. We show that belief is either true or false by looking at reality. Reality is that my dad, my biological father, has white hair. He's 5'7", and, well, he's Santa Claus. Okay? He's jolly. Uh, I'm not going to tell you his way. Uh, but notice, so we take Corey's belief, and we would say his beliefs are false because they don't match up with reality. If you think my dad is 5'7", has white hair, and is jolly, then your beliefs are true because your beliefs will match up with reality. See? So are you with me? We said, okay, now knowledge is what? Knowledge is, a okay, truth is narrow. Knowledge, I define knowledge as justified true belief. Say that with me. Justified true belief. So, what have we talked about so far? We've talked about belief. We've talked about truth. Is it enough to simply say I have true beliefs to also say that I have knowledge? Think, you've probably never thought about that question before. Is it enough? If I have true beliefs... Is having a true belief the same thing as having knowledge? I don't think so. And this is why, now this is really important for you guys. Because I think a lot of you, you've probably grown up in the church. Maybe your mom and dad are Christians, you come from a Christian home, or you've been here at, uh, you know, Crocs for a while. And you can still consider yourself a Christian, and I, I bet that you have a lot of true beliefs. I think if you think that God exists, I think you have a true belief. If you think that Jesus is the way to God, I think you have a true belief. If you think Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose again, I think you have true beliefs. But I don't think that's enough to really give you confidence. It's not enough for you to say, I know. Look, you can have a true belief, but you could be lucky, right? If I'm a mathematician, right, or a physicist, and I say to you, E equals MC squared, I think you're probably going to have a lot of confidence that I know that, right? But let's just say I'm a, a homeless guy, and I was uh, in a, you know, a public restroom, and I saw on the bathroom stall, E equals MC squared. And I came up to you and I said, hey, E equals MC squared. Would you say that I know that just in the same way that the mathematician knows that? No, you'd probably say, I got lucky. <laughs> I read it on the bathroom stall. So, I, but, but do I have a true belief? I still have a true belief. The mathematician has a true belief. 
The homeless guy has a true belief if they say E equals MC squared. What's the difference? Here's the key. The difference is in what we call justification. Justification. Notice, knowledge is just, say it with me, knowledge is justified, justified true, true, justified true belief. Let's do that again. Knowledge is justified true belief. So now here's the key. What do we mean by justification? All we mean is reasons and evidence. Reasons and evidence. You may have true beliefs about God. What we want to do through a series like this is give you now the justification. We want to give you the reasons. Here's what reasons and evidence will do. Reasons and evidence will turn your true beliefs into knowledge that will then give you confidence that what you believe is really the truth about all of reality. That's exactly what Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3.15. Right? He says, when people ask you, when people ask you, you and I are always to be prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have. That reason is the justification. People are going to ask you about your true beliefs. You believe in God? You believe in Jesus? You believe in the Bible? You go to church? Okay, why? Why do you think this stuff is true. Why do you think your faith is the one true faith? And at that point, what they're asking is what is your justification? What are your reasons? And Peter says, always be ready to make a defense or to give a reason. And that's what we do in apologetics. And that's why we're doing a series like this. To help you to not just say, I believe it, I believe it, I believe it. Not to simply say, I believe it and it's true. But ultimately, we want you to say, I believe that it's true, and I have good reason to think it's true. I know it's true. As I've been studying Christianity and other world religions for 20 years now, I am more convinced today. I can walk out of this room and I can say, I know that this stuff is true. And that's what we want to give you, is that kind of confidence. Okay, a couple resources. We got our resources online. Because this series, we're going to touch on a few things, but there's a lot more. I hope you realize that knowing what you believe and why you believe it is a lifelong process. So go to our website, str.org, and check out the resources there. Connect with us on social media. Send in your questions. We want to help you out. For those students here who really want to go deeper, we have a free resource for you. Go back to the table, find this card, fill it out. I will send you free stuff on a regular basis to help you know what you believe and why you believe it. It's called Solid Ground. All right. All right, we've got a bunch of good questions coming in that we're going to throw up on the screen in just a second. Okay. So, um, here's the key. Where does faith come into this? Faith is simply trust. Faith is trust in what you have good reason to believe is true. And so, should you put your faith in Allah? Should you put your faith in Buddha? Should you put your faith in Joseph Smith? Our argument for the next few weeks is going to be the most reasonable thing to do is to put your faith in Jesus Christ because that's where the evidence points us to. All right. So, All right. let's take some questions. Phone number one more time for those of you who didn't get it is on the screen. Load that into your phone real quick before we throw up the first question. Sean, can I take you have question? to text in the questions. No, you can text it in now. Well, ask someone who's in this century. All right, first question. All right, first question. How does Christianity line up with reality? Really, really good. Um, I would. Here's what I'd say. I say Christianity is the truth about reality. Christianity is the truth about reality. So, when we say, we make claims about Jesus. Jesus was God in human flesh. I think that is uh, uh, really true. I think 2,000 years ago, God, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, came down and took on human flesh. When we say, uh, Jesus rose bodily from the grave, I think that matches up with reality. I think that's what really happened 2,000 years ago. When we say God exists, I don't think we're saying, well, I just believe it. I think what we're saying, well, what we are saying is that there's a being God out there and he exists whether you believe in him or not. 
And I think Christianity, this book, gives us knowledge of reality. So I think it lines up really well. And then the question is, okay, well, what's the evidence? And that's what we're going to go through. Next question. When beliefs are opinions, how do you match them to reality when other people's views vary as well as yours? Is there a solid answer? Okay. Uh, well, I would say belief, let's just use beliefs and opinions uh, interchangeably. It's the same thing. Okay, Beliefs, opinions. So um, how do you match up your beliefs with reality? And lots of people have different views, so how do you know yours, your belief is matched up with reality? Well, thankfully, we have, we have different ways that we, we can kind of explore reality. Right? One way we explore reality is through our five senses. And so we, God has given us eyes and ears and, and, and the ability to smell and to touch. And, and so our five senses give us uh, knowledge about reality. So, for instance, you walk into the room. You have a belief that, uh, that, that uh, tonight's program started at 7. You come in because you have five senses. You walk in here. If nobody was in here, you would see that no one's in here, and you would match your belief with reality and say, okay, my belief is false. It's got to be in another room, or maybe it's not tonight. That's what we do. We fire our five senses all the time. Uh, but then also, we don't just have five senses, but we also have a, what we call a rational mind, a mind that has the ability to reason. So, for instance, if you walked in this room and your five senses told you that no one else was in here and that it was dark, you would then start to reason. You would start thinking, okay, the group must not be meeting in here. It must be meeting somewhere else. Or maybe the group doesn't meet. So you would start reasoning. And that's the other way that we really start learning about reality. Five senses, reasoning, and then sometimes when someone reveals truth to us, when someone tells us, that's another way. We, in fact, that's probably how we know most of what we know, is someone's told us. And we, we trust their testimony. So if you, you come up to me, you're like, Brett, what time is it? I'm like, oh, it's... Uh, what, A19. You're going to just kind of just trust. Okay, yeah, Brent's probably telling me the truth. Yeah. And, and you'll know that it's A19. And so sometimes we get our knowledge from people telling us things. Those are the ways. And so what you have to do is you just have to kind of take your beliefs and match it up with reality through your five senses, your rational mind, and sources that you trust. And that's just a kind of a common sense way that we discover whether or not our beliefs match up with reality. All right? And so, yes, I think there's solid answers, and those solid answers are backed up by reason and evidence and proof. And so I think Christianity is backed up by the evidence. In one sentence, how would you sum up how we can justify Christianity? We can justify Christianity through evidence. Now, I think there's different kinds of evidence, if I were to add to that one sentence. There's different kinds of evidence. There's going to be historical evidence. There's going to be philosophical evidence. There's going to be scientific evidence. There's also going to be evidence of experience. I think some of us have had real experiences of God. And that's evidence that he's real. And he's in our lives. And so I would say there's all kinds of evidence. And evidence justifies Christianity. Good question. Next. What are the best ways to answer when faced with a question about Christianity? Uh, well, I guess... I can't answer that question without knowing what the specific question is. And so I think when people start challenging you, first find out what they believe and why they believe it. So ask them, what do you mean by that? What's your view? And don't just say that, though. They say, I'm an atheist. They say, well, what does that mean? Oh, I don't think there's any God. Okay, cool. No, you ask them why. What is their evidence? Why are you an atheist? What's your evidence for atheism? Uh, someone's a Muslim. Okay, wh why? What's your view? What, what do you think about God? What do you think about salvation? And why? Why do you think Islam is true? So ask what and then why. Ask why all the time. We're not the only ones who have to answer the why. Everybody has a view, and everybody should have good reason to believe their view. Make sense? Okay. We can't use our five senses to know God. How do we know he is real? The Bible could be fictional. Okay. A couple different questions there. Uh, I, yeah, we actually can use our five senses to know God. Um, if, if God, if certainly we have we have we have testimony in the Scripture just of God appearing. We have testimony from people who say, "Hey, uh, you know, I saw this miraculous event." Um, there are people who have said, "Hey, I heard an audible voice of God." So our five senses can give us knowledge about God. If God wanted to, he could uh, he could appear in all His glory in this room. Of course, we'd all die, but um, he could do that. 
And our five senses would give us knowledge of God and His glory. So I, our five senses can't tell us some things about God. Uh, and certainly then He has revealed things about Himself in the Scriptures. I, I need part of my five senses to be able to read, right? I've got to have eyesight to read. So our five senses do give us knowledge about God. And, uh, and we reason, and then He's told us stuff about Himself. Certainly the Bible could be fictional. But, but then you could say anything could be fictional. I mean, I could say anything could be fictional, right? It's possible that atheism is fictional. It's possible that Islam is fictional. But we don't want to deal, just deal with possibilities. We want to know what's probable. I think the Bible could be fictional, but I don't actually think it is fictional. Why? Because I have good reason to think that this book is more than just a human invention. I have good reason to think that this book is from God. I have evidence. I have a lot of evidence.